For the rest of us, if you have your Bible with you, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Going through the book of Hebrews, uh, walking straight through. So we've been through the first six chapters so far. So now seven comes after six. So that's why we're in chapter 7 today. And this is kind of a difficult passage. So um, that's all I want to say. So back in chapter 5 of Hebrews, we started talking about our need for a priest. You remember that? That's, that's strange language for us as Baptists, you know, to say we need a priest. But we saw that, that God had uh, always ordained that sinners come to him through a priest, a mediator, a representative. Uh, a priest needs to make atonement for sinners if they're going to come before God. And we have a priest. We have the only priest. We have the only perfect and eternal high priest, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the Son of God. He is our priest. Jesus, God and man, lived perfectly according to God's law, fulfilled the covenant of God, and then gave himself as a sacrifice on the cross for our sin. He ascended, rose from the dead, ascended into the throne room of glory, and now represents us who trust in him before the Father. He is our priest. Now the way is open for us to go to the throne with boldness to go through the throne of, to the throne of grace, not through another human being, but through Jesus, who is God and man, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is our mediator. Now Hebrews began, the book of Hebrews began telling us about Jesus as our priest in chapter 5. And then he quoted Psalm 110 Verse 4 in chapter 5, if you remember when we were back in 5, he said, as he also says in another place, you are a priest, he's talking about the Son, the Messiah, forever after the order of Melchizedek. We read that in chapter 5, it was a quote from Psalm 110. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, he started to explain about how Jesus is the high priest and Jesus is our perfect priest and the only priest. He said Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And then in chapter 6, he says, I want to tell you more about this but you guys are dull of hearing. I didn't say that about y'all. He said that about, the, about who the readers were in the Hebrews. And then from 6, uh, really from 5.11 all the way down through chapter 6, he says, you guys need to go on to maturity. And he gave a warning and all of that. And now in chapter 7, he comes back to the teaching of Jesus as our priest in the order of Melchizedek. He is the true and perfect high priest for all time. Now the whole argument of chapter 7 is that Jesus' priesthood is superior to the Old Testament priests, to the Levites who were priests in the Old Testament, because Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. There's going to be a lot of ways we can get lost in the text of chapter 7. Just remember that. That's the point. Jesus' priesthood is superior to the Levites, to the Old Testament priests. And he, because he's in the order of Melchizedek. If you don't know what a Melchizedek is, don't worry, we're going to explain it. We'll get to it. So let's read verses. I want to read verses 1 through 15 and then stop there and then go back and take them. But we're going to go all the way through 22 today. Are you with me? All right. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to hit the ground running. It says this in chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is, Melchizedek is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning nor days of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. Though these, are, uh, these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, talking about Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. 
for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. All right, you got it? Do you even need me to explain it? That's a pretty dense section, isn't it? All right. So when we say, when we say, when I tell you Jesus is our high priest and he's better than the Levitical priest, the Old Testament, Old Covenant priest, what we say is, okay, got it. Let's move on to something else. You know, that's easy for us. We understand that. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not hard. But for the Hebrews who this letter is written to, raised under the Old Testament law, it wasn't quite so easy. So the writer spends considerable amount of time proving that Jesus is better than the Levitical priest. So what we need to do this morning is we need to step into the shoes of these Hebrew readers to understand why this argument is so important and why he spends so much time proving that Jesus is better than these Levitical priests. The Hebrews had had it ingrained in them for a thousand years That no one, no one can come to God except through a Levite, a Levitical priest who offered a sacrifice at the tabernacle or later at the temple. Their culture, their heritage, their upbringing. Listen, even the law God gave Moses said, no one comes to me unless they go through a priest and a priest has to be from the tribe of Levi. God's command to them in scripture said so. And no one could be a priest unless you were from the tribe of Levi. God himself commanded it. The Levites were the only people that were allowed to function as priests. No one else need apply. But when these Hebrews had come to Christ, that's who he's writing to. Hebrew Christians who were being tempted to go back to Judaism and go back to the Old Testament law. When they had come to Christ, for years they had left this idea behind and they had been coming to God, as it were, through Jesus. But now in the throes of suffering and and persecution and trial and all of the things that we've talked about so far in the book of Hebrews, they were rethinking their position. Following Christ had brought them pain. It had brought them persecution. It had brought them suffering. And all of their Jewish families and friends, they said, listen, God doesn't accept you through this Jesus who you claim. Why? Because God's law, his infallible word says that if you want to go to him and you want to be right with him, you have to go through a Levite. You have to go through a Levite priest who's bearing an offering for you. Open your Bible and read it. It says it right there. Jesus cannot be your priest because he isn't from the tribe of Levi. He isn't qualified by God's own law to be your priest And that's why, Mr. Hebrew Christian, that you're suffering so much. Because God doesn't accept you. God doesn't love you. God doesn't receive you through Jesus because he is not qualified to be your priest. That's the argument. That's the argument that's being taken up in chapter 7. So imagine yourself a Hebrew professing Christian and everybody around you, you're going against everything you've ever known, everything you've ever been taught, everything that you think that the Old Testament, Old Covenant says, and all of your family, all of your friends, all of your culture, all of your heritage, all of the people you know are saying, that can't be right. It says it right here. Look, this was a big temptation for them. So what we're going to do is we're going to build, we're going to take this argument a piece at a time in chapter seven, and I'm going to show you how he's applying this But before we do that, I want you to see where we're going because it's easy, as you saw, it's easy to get lost in all that in chapter 7. The point of the whole section of all this argument is in verse 25. We're not going to get there today. We're going to look at it next week. But this is his point. Because of all this argument he makes, consequently, verse 25, he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is your priest 
And he can save you to the uttermost because you can draw near to God through him. That's the point. Jesus is better than the Levite priests under the law of Moses because his priesthood is eternal. It's established by God before the Levites were even born. And only he can save perfectly, forever cleansing sinners before God. Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. That's his point. That's where we're headed. So let's build this argument one brick at a time. You still with me? Close enough. All right, first thing he says in the first three verses of chapter 7 is that this Melchizedek guy and his priesthood points to Jesus, and it's intended to point to Jesus. He says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, to Melchizedek, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. The word tenth, the word tithe just means tenth. And then, oh, it says, excuse me, it says, portion of the tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. The writer of Hebrews is giving us facts about Melchizedek from the only place in Genesis that Melchizedek appears. From Genesis 14. So what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is he's referencing the text of Scripture. Referencing Genesis 14 to show that there is an order of priests. There is a kind of priest that has always pointed to Christ. Before the law of Moses was given. Before the Levites were born. Before God came to them at Sinai. Before all of that, God had a priest. In Genesis 14... Four kings united together and attacked and captured Lot, Abraham's nephew. And Abraham gathered his family together and he went after them. He defeated them and he brought all the captives back and he brought all the spoils of the battle back. And when Abraham came back, the king of Sodom and this mysterious man, Melchizedek, came out to meet him. Let's read it in Genesis 14. This is all Genesis says about Melchizedek. After his, Abraham's return from the defeat of Ketalamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him. He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Other than our passage in Hebrews and Psalm 110 that we saw quoted earlier in Hebrews, this is the only mention of Melchizedek in the whole Bible. Genesis 14 is it. That's all we know about it. This all scripture says about Melchizedek. We know he was a king of Salem, city that was later called Jerusalem. He is also a priest of the Most High God. Where did he come from? How did he become a priest of the Most High God in a pagan land where God's chosen man is Abraham? What happened to him after this? Did his priesthood continue? How did it continue in his line? We're not told any of this. What the writer of Hebrews is doing in these first three verses is he's showing us from the text of Genesis 14 that God ordained a priesthood that doesn't depend on family lineage as the Levites do in the Old Testament law. Melchizedek was appointed as a priest by God hundreds of years before the first Levite was born. Melchizedek is a priest and he is a king in Genesis 14. Something that was forbidden in the law of Moses. Priests were from the tribe of Levi. Kings came from the tribe of Judah and David. So this priesthood of God was before all of the law of Moses, before all the sacrifices, before all the ceremonies, before all of that stuff. Not only that, the writer of Hebrews tells us even the man's name points to the Messiah of God. In verse 2, he says, he is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. In Hebrew, Melech means king and Zedek means righteousness. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness. He says, and he is king of Salem, the city Salem. Salem comes from the word shalom, which means peace. He's king of righteousness, king of peace. 
Both righteousness and peace are qualities foretold to be the character of the Messiah. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says he will be the prince of peace. He will rule in righteousness. So Melchizedek's priesthood points to Christ. This man's name points to Christ. And Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, God showed you way back in Genesis that there is another type of priest than just Levites. He showed you way back then. And the writer of Hebrews also says that what Genesis says about Melchizedek points to Christ. And what Genesis doesn't say about Melchizedek points to Christ. Verse 3 said, he's without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now, because of that statement, some have taken Melchizedek, this man, to actually be an angel or pre-incarnate Christ or There's a lot of different theories about who he is. But the writer of Hebrews is not declaring that this man to be a a supernatural being just by saying this. He is applying the text of Genesis to his audience. He's showing them from the scripture. He's applying applying the account of Genesis. He says what the text says points to Jesus and what the text doesn't say points to Jesus. In Genesis, genealogies are everywhere. I mean, every person of importance in the book of Genesis has their genealogy given. And because of that, Melchizedek, this guy, really stands out. There's no mention of his parents. There's no mention of his origin, what happened to him, how he became a priest in the first place, how God called him, how God chose him. He appears out of nowhere and he disappears in the text of Scripture. We're never told anything about him again. The writer of Hebrews' point is that when Genesis was written... The Holy Spirit intended for these things not to be mentioned in order for him to point to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. God was foreshadowing who the true priest would be, showing us a priesthood that he ordained and he established. Notice at the end of verse 3, he says, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. You see what he's saying? It's not that Jesus is like Melchizedek. No, it's the opposite. Melchizedek resembles the Son of God. Melchizedek was always supposed to point you to the true priest, is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Now, when it says he continues forever, does that mean he never died? Like you're going to run into Melchizedek at Walmart tomorrow or something? He's still walking around? Of course not. The priesthood appointed by God continues forever. But but how do you know that? I mean, how does the author of Hebrews know that the priesthood continues forever? Just because Genesis doesn't say anything about what happened to him. I mean, isn't that making a leap of logic a little bit? Is the writer of Hebrews just making stuff up to go along with what is said and what is not said in Genesis about who this man was and where he came from? Not at all. Like any good Bible interpreter, the writer of Hebrews knows that Scripture interprets Scripture. So, when he says he continues forever, what he's doing is taking the psalm he's quoted over and over and over again and setting it up next to Genesis 14. David, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, prophesied by the Holy Spirit in Psalm 110 verse 4 that God would ordain the Messiah in the order of Melchizedek, a priest forever. He is comparing scripture with scripture, Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. The only two places in the Old Testament that Melchizedek is mentioned outside of our passage in Hebrews. So Hebrews is showing us this priest and this king pointed to the perfect priest and the king to come. He's showing the Hebrew Christians that they can't go back to the old Levitical priest. They can't go back to the old law. They can't go back to the old ways. God has given Jesus a better priesthood. One that he's shown you was coming way back in in Genesis. He is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So he has a priesthood that is greater than the Levite priests. Are y'all with me? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> G- Melchizedek pointed to Jesus, and Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than the Levite priesthoods. All right, hang with me. We're going to just read one verse at a time now. So, Verse 4 says, See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. 
From the Genesis account we just read, the writer proves that Jesus' priesthood is better because in Genesis, Abraham gave tithes, gave a tenth to Melchizedek. Now in Genesis, listen, Abraham was under no obligation, under no law, under no command to give Melchizedek anything. In fact, if you go back and read Genesis 14, uh, the king of Sodom asked for the captives to be given to him. And Abraham said, I'm not giving you nothing. But yet, in that account, Abraham saw that this Melchizedek, this king and this priest of the Most High God was greater than him. That's saying something. I mean, Abraham in Genesis is a man chosen by God, called the friend of God. He is the bearer of God's promise and had just defeated this coalition of kings, coming back in victory. And when Abraham met this man, Melchizedek, he knew immediately that this priest king of the most high God, El Elyon is what it says, was greater than he was. He was a priest of Abraham's God. Because Abraham recognized him as superior than he, he paid tithes, it says, a tenth to him. Now, the Hebrews reading this might say, hold on, hold on. Melchizedek receiving tithes doesn't really prove anything. I mean, the Levitical priests also received tithes from all of Israel. Yes, the Old Testament priests received tithes, but they did because God commanded it, not because they were superior. Look at verse 5. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. Though these also are descended from Abraham. They're all the same, but they have a command from God to receive tithes. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, from Abraham, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. You see the argument he's making? In the law of Moses, God commanded that Israel pay tithes to the Levites, the priests. Not because the Levites were superior or of a higher status. The Levites were their brothers. They were all from Abraham. They were all Israel, Abraham's children. But Melchizedek was different. And Abraham, the father of Israel, recognized it. Melchizedek's superiority is proven in the fact that he blessed Abraham. That is huge. Though we read right past it and don't really take it much into account, he blessed Abraham. Remember who Abraham is? Abraham bore the promise of God. God said, through you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Technically, Abraham is supposed to be blessing Melchizedek. He's supposed to be blessing all these people because through him, God would bless the whole world, he said. But here standing before this priest king, it was Abraham who received a blessing because the true priest of God stood before him. His point, right? Hebrews point is that the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And what is true of Abraham is true of every son of Abraham, every priest that came from Abraham's offspring. In verse 8, it says, in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, Levites, but in the other case, by one whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, the priests of Levi, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. If the lesser pays tithes to the greater, then the Levites themselves, the author of Hebrews says, must acknowledge the superiority of the priesthood of Melchizedek. The writer of Hebrews argues that the Levites paid tithes to Melchizedek in advance because they themselves came from Abraham's body and Abraham paid them. Now all of this, this very dense argument, is to prove that the old covenant Mosaic law, that priesthood, was never intended to be permanent. All this is to prove that a better priesthood than the Levites and the Old Covenant law and the Mosaic law was always God's intent from the beginning. He's pointing back to Genesis to say, 
it was never God's intent that the Levitical priests and the Levitical law and all of the tabernacle and the temple and how people came to God through the old covenant was to be permanent. God showed you back then there was another kind of priest. God showed you in the scriptures themselves before Moses, Aaron, or a single Levite was ever born. God gave us a glimpse, a type, a foreshadow of the perfect priesthood which he had established way back in Abraham's day to show that the Levitical priests and the old covenant sacrificial system was nothing more than an imperfect picture of what was to come. And finally, the last section that we're going to look at today is that this whole thing about Melchizedek really is just him telling them that Jesus fulfills this greater priesthood that I've been talking about. Jesus fulfills this priest in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 11 says, Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priests, for under it the people received the law, meaning the law was administrated by the Levitical priests, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Listen, perfection here means the the complete and full washing away of sin. The opening of the door to let sinners into the presence of God. Total reconciliation between sinners and a holy God. That's perfection that he's talking about. The Levitical priests couldn't give that. Even back when they were administering the law of Moses and sacrifices. They could never take away sin permanently. You walked in to the tabernacle and a priest met you with your sacrifice and they offered that sacrifice on the altar. Your sin was covered until you sinned again. As you walked out of the tabernacle, if you didn't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you had to go back and you had to make another sacrifice over and over and over and over and over and over again for all of your life. It would never be perfect It was always just a cover, a picture to show the perfect that was to come. He says, listen, if that was perfect and that was the way it's supposed to be forever and God intended it to be that way, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise? Why would God say, I'm going to send you another priest, a perfect priest? You say, well, when did God say that another priesthood was needed? He said it in Psalm 110. It's already been quoted twice in Hebrews. It's going to get quoted again in a minute. The point he's making is that he says, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. If the priests under the Mosaic covenant with their sacrifices and their laws and their ceremonies, if that was the be all end all, if that was the way God intended it to be for all eternity, why did David hundreds of years later prophesy that a Messiah would come as a priest in the order of Melchizedek? Why is another kind of priest necessary if the Levitical priests were so great? Why would the Lord swear by an oath to make his son a better priest? No, the point is, God always purposed a better priesthood than the Levites and the tabernacle and the sacrifices. God always purposed a better, more perfect priest who actually could make the people perfect. Now those readers, those Hebrew readers might say, but that cannot be. God gave a law. It's written right there. Exodus and Deuteronomy, God gave his law, his word, saying no one could be a priest unless they were from the tribe of Levi. You can't change that in the text. Anticipating this objection, he says, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well, meaning about who is qualified to be a priest. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe. He's saying, yeah, there's a change in the law of qualification for priests. The one whom these things are spoken about belong to a tribe from which no one has ever served the altar. For it's evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. He says a new priesthood means a change in the law about the qualifications of who can be a priest. Jesus is humanly descended from the line of Judah, the line of Israel's kings, not their priests. So you are correct. Jesus could not be qualified to be a Levitical priest under the Mosaic Covenant. 
But as the eternal son of God, Jesus is qualified to fulfill the role of the perfect eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. And his qualification for his office is not from his lineage. It's not from what tribe he descends from. It's from his resurrection from the dead. His indestructible life. He says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, look at it, not on the basis of a legal requirement, the law, concerning bodily descent. So he came from whatever tribe. But why is he qualified? By the power of an indestructible life. The resurrection. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever. Psalm 110, again after the order of Melchizedek. His qualification is not based on the law of Moses or the tribe of Israel which he came from, but because he lives forever, resurrected from the dead. In his resurrection as God and man, Jesus lives eternally, forever, as the only effective mediator, the only perfect priest, forever representing his people before God. And that's what David meant in Psalm 110 that's quoted in verse 17. You are a priest forever. Not just your line, but you are a priest forever. He will never die. He's defeated death after the order of Melchizedek. That's what David meant. So you're saying Jesus' priesthood replaces the old Levitical priesthood. That's exactly what he's saying. In verses 18 and 19, he says this. For on the one hand... A former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced. And it's through this hope that we draw near to God. The Levitical priests are now set aside. Unnecessary, inadequate. He says weak and useless Jesus Christ is the only one qualified to be our true high priest. He alone is eternal, lives forever in his resurrection. He alone is able to mediate before God as both God and man. He is a living priest representing us before God. When it says the law made nothing perfect, you need to understand the law of God is holy and it's righteous and it's good. But we've sinned and we've fallen in Adam. The law cannot make us perfect. All it can do is condemn us. The law only has the power to identify our sin and to judge that sin. The law has no power to remedy the problem and make us right before God. If you've sinned, there is no way that you can do good to make it right. You can't go back in time and fix it and doing a good deed doesn't do anything to make that sin go away. And even in the Old Testament, those laws that prescribe sacrifices and ceremonies and rituals, they couldn't do away with sin either. They could only cover it until another sacrifice, another ceremony, another ritual was necessary to cover more of your sin. So the old priesthood could never make anything perfect. The old covenant, the old law could never make anything perfect. But the true high priest gives us a better hope. When he says hope... A lot of times we think hope like, I hope it don't rain this afternoon. He's talking about the expectation, the assurance. We have a better assurance that has been introduced. And it's through this assurance, this expectation that we draw near to God. We don't need to continually return offering sacrifice after sacrifice, ceremony after ceremony, ritual after ritual, work after work. There's no need to continually worry about the ceremonies and the rituals to gain access to our relationship with a holy God. We have a hope. Through which, through him, that we draw near to God. And we need no other priest. Now, we freely and continually draw near to God through Jesus Christ. You don't go through me to get to God. You don't go through mom and dad to get to God. You don't go through any other human being. You must go through the only priest that has opened the way for you, Jesus Christ. He lives forever, representing his people 
once for all with his perfect sacrifice. And the writer said, last verses we'll look at today, you can be assured of it. You don't have to be worried about what your friends and family say, you know, your Jewish friends and Jewish family saying, oh, you, Jesus is not qualified. You can't be, you can be assured of it because God swore that he is a priest forever. He says that in verses 20 through 22, he says, and it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests, the Levites were made such without an oath. But this one, Jesus was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, Psalm 110.4, again, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And verse 22 says, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The Levites didn't have an oath from God that their priesthood would continue forever and be effective forever. And remember, when Hebrews was written, the temple was still standing. The priests were still working. They were still going in and going out and doing the sacrifices and all of those things were still going on when this letter was written. And yet he says, God never promised that would continue. But this priest that we have in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, the righteous, he has been given the sure oath of God the Father that he will be a priest forever and you will come to God through him forever and ever and ever and ever. And we have God's promise, God's oath. He swore it by himself that it will not change. So this Jesus who I've been talking about, the writer of Hebrews might say, The perfect priest in the order of Melchizedek is now the guarantor of a better covenant. That statement, when he says that in verse 22, I chose to stop here in 22 instead of going on through the rest of this passage, which is part of the passage because, well, I didn't want to keep you here for three hours, but I stopped in 22 because this statement would, it would knock them back on their heels. They would have said, whoa. I mean, this is the first time in the letter of Hebrews that the word covenant is used. His argument now is coming into focus. He's talking about the covenant. The new covenant has replaced the old. The new priesthood of Jesus has superseded the old Levitical priesthood. Jesus, the perfect high priest, is the only way we can draw near to God. Our only hope of eternal salvation I think they might start to realize here to go back to the old priests, the old law, the old ways, working for your salvation, doing the rituals, doing the ceremonies, doing all the things we want to do to please God. Going back to that is not going back to a previous relationship with God. It's departing from God. The only way that we can come to him now is through Jesus Christ. Technically, it was through Jesus Christ from beginning to end. But in this side, in the New Testament, after the cross, he is clearly and definably, God has said he is the only priest. We're going to finish this chapter next week where he draws this conclusion that Jesus is able to save perfectly and forever those who draw near to God through him. But that's the point of this dense argument. All that, all that talk about the kind of priest Melchizedek is and who he is and, and what his name means is to show us that Jesus' priesthood, which is perfect and complete and eternal, has been God's intent from the beginning. God's wrath, his holiness, his justice, they never change. So there's only one hope for sinners like us. We have to have a faithful and perfect high priest to represent us before the Father, to remove our sin and the stain and guilt of that sin, to give us a righteousness that we don't possess and we can't earn and open the way that we may have access to enter into the presence of a holy and righteous God. We need a king of righteousness. We need a king of peace. We need a priest without beginning and without end, an indestructible life who will never die, never need to be replaced, never need to be done over to give us forever perfection. Who else fills that picture that God pointed to in Melchizedek? Who else is qualified by his own divine, eternal life and resurrection? Who else can give us righteousness before God and peace knowing that our sins are atoned for? He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. We need a priest. And we have one. By grace, God has given his perfect salvation 
and a perfect sacrifice in his son. By grace, he has appointed to us a perfect priest to atone for our sin, to represent us in the throne room of a holy God. But he is only your priest through faith alone. It is only by grace through faith that you're united to this priest. Only through faith does he remove your sin and become your representative before God. Therefore, as the writer of Hebrews is continually telling his readers, hold fast to Jesus. Trust in Jesus because he is sufficient. Trust in nothing else. Trust not in your works, in your religious ceremonies, in your rituals, in your goodness because you have none, in your determination to do right and to live right, in your decision to turn over a new leaf and start living better. None of that will save you. None of that will present you holy and righteous before God. Only Jesus, the perfect high priest, will present you holy and blameless without sin before God. Trust in Jesus alone. He died in your place. He alone secured your position before God. Give him your heart and life today. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your word. God, we pray that you would help us to see the perfection that you have given in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray that you would help us as believers in this room to walk in that perfection, to walk in that assurance that we have been accepted through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and absolutely nothing else. Help us to hold fast to that profession. God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, hasn't trusted in you, maybe they've been told all their lives that you have to work hard, you have to do better, you have to be righteous, you have to live a certain way in order for God to accept you, and they've seen the futility of trying because we are sinners. God, I pray that you would speak to them today, that you would show them Jesus, who paid the price, who died on the cross to pay for that sin and to give us his righteousness, and that they would call out upon your name this morning that they would trust in Jesus and be saved. God, we pray that you would move amongst us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to stand right down here at the front. I would love to pray with you if you want to come. I'd love to speak with you.